Good morning and welcome to the forum at Harvard School of Public Health. My name is Tony Clark. I'm a reporter with Reuters um, and I will be moderating today's discussion. As you know, unless you've been in a coma over the last 24 hours, <laughs> the Supreme Court uh, yesterday upheld the constitutionality of the Obama administration's signature piece of legislation, the Affordable Care Act. Um, crucially, it upheld the individual mandate, um, which will require most Americans to buy health insurance or pay a penalty. Uh, it did um, strike down the uh, forced expansion of Medi Medicaid, and we'll, ex we'll discuss that. But clearly, this is just the beginning. Um, the Republicans have ruled to, that they will repeal the, um, the law, and there'll be many challenges in implementing it. So today we're going to discuss the implications of the ruling from a political point of view, from a public health point of view, um, from a legal point of view, and um, uh, we will have the, our distinguished panel here talk for about half an hour, then we'll throw open the questions to the floor and also to our viewers online and on the internet. So with that, I'll um, introduce our panel. Um, to my left here, we have uh, Robert Blendon, who is Professor of Health Policy and Political Analyst Analysis at Harvard School of Public Health. To his left, we have Wendy Mariner, the Edward Utley Professor of Health Law, Bioethics and Human Rights at Boston University School of Public Health. We have John McDonough, Professor of Public Health Practice and Director of the school's Center for Public Health Leadership and Regina Herzlinger, the Nancy R. McPherson Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. Welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Um, Bob, perhaps I'll throw it to you first. Um, talk a little bit about um, how you see this playing out in the 2012 elections. So you almost have to apologize to audiences. That yesterday was an historic day. For many of you, it should be over. The problem is it isn't. The real uh, issue will occur, uh, occur in the election. And let me just briefly explain. If you're from another country, what you don't realize is that since this bill has been passed, the majority of Americans have never supported it once. And it's not the majority that counts. It is the division in the country. It's almost like two separate countries. So when you interview Republicans, 75% opposed this bill and want it repealed from the day, the hour it was signed. 70% uh, of Democrats want this bill implemented, love it, think the president did an historic achievement. Uh, and so uh, what do we have uh, is that we have uh, Republicans starting uh, with Governor Romney down to every member of the House and Senate who will run, who will have a simple line, I'll repeal it. Uh, uh, for this, uh, and to show their seriousness this month, they will vote repeal in the House and it will win. But it will not go through the Senate and the presidency because the parties held the other way. Uh, so uh, there's no issue is, is more polarized. It turns out opponents to this bill, so people say what happens, it turns out to feel more strongly about it than the proponents of it. Uh, they just have in their heads, it's two different worlds. The, uh, I want to describe what came out of the uh, decision because it's going to change the debate and alert the audience. Uh, you will expect to see uh, two presidential candidates, the President and Governor Romney, debating the content of health care. And you will discover that Governor Romney goes like this and the President goes like that. Governor Romney is not going to get in the content of health care. He's going to talk about that this bill seriously affects the future of the economy and that he'll quote the Supreme Court just said, as he did, it's a tax. Uh, you are taxing middle-income people in the middle of an economic downturn. Uh, and we cannot afford, given the deficit in the economic side, to go ahead with this bill. The president will be like he's having another debate. He's going to be over here. He's going to tell you about uh, sick people with pre-existing conditions. He's going to tell you about how people are covered. He's going to tell you about public health. And Governor Romney is never going to lose a beat. Tax costs too much people aren't hired. Uh, we're not going to know to November 7th the answer to this question in this country, where this bill goes. But it's a mistake. It was a huge historic event yesterday. It's a mistake to believe the debate is over. If it is repealed, um, do you have a sense, do you, I'll throw it open uh, to, to all of you, what could replace, what could replace it? Where will we go from there? Well, the Republicans have always favored tax credits, tax deductions, 
And uh, I think that a bill along those lines will be introduced, which would give people who buy health insurance a credit, enable a private health insurance market that's pretty consistent with Republican thinking. Something has been lost along the way, though. Uh, prior to the summer of 2009, when health reform became deeply politically contentious and divisive, there was a shared sense among Democrats and Republicans around the country that we all believe in universal health insurance. We just have different ideas about how to get there. And I see a fundamental shift where I see the Republican Party now has moved away from any meaningful commitment to universal health care. And so I think we're in a different place right now, which I think has a lot of implications for what would come next if we had a complete repeal. I agree with that. The initial tax credit bills, which were introduced by very conservative Republicans, were with the aim of getting universal coverage in what they viewed a more cost-controlled way. That feeling is no longer there. Wendy, what, what is your view on this? Well, of course, <clears throat> I look at it from the perspective of law professors, and that's no recommendation because most constitutional <laughs> law professors were dead wrong on all three <laughs> issues. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. That's what's in trade. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, right. that's, yeah. that's correct. Right. Um, so I, I, so I think at the court level, the politics um, are not necessarily about the election, but they are about the power of federal government. Um, the, the decision strongly laid out limits to the federal government's power under the Commerce Clause, which is something that several justices, especially Thomas Scalia and earlier Roberts, were hoping to do and have tried to do incrementally over the years. And they succeeded in getting five votes for that point of view in this decision. Their analysis of the expansion of Medicaid was uh, shocking to almost everyone, including me, that there was a limitation on how generous the federal government could be in providing funding, um, an offer you can't refuse, you know. Small offers are okay, it seems. It's surprising how cheaply the states can be bought, actually. <laughs> um, but when it's really big money, <laughs> said the court, the majority, in, including Kagan and Breyer, um, then that is too much. And what was, I think, telling in Robert's opinion was that he said this expansion, the expanded eligibility, was really not just another amendment like many in the past had expanded eligibility for Medicaid in the 80s and so on. But this, this was a larger expansion that created an entire new act, in a sense, a brand new program, which I find unpersuasive factually, but was certainly persuasive to those in the majority. And so he said, I kept the quote, um, it's no longer a program to care for the neediest among us, but rather an element of a comprehensive national plan to provide universal health insurance coverage. It's like the camel's nose under the tent. Um, very concerned about the federal government taking over the distribution and the, and the coverage of care. In contrast, calling it a tax allows the federal government to tax individuals. So while the, while the, the opinion is very solicitous of state sovereignty, both with respect to Medicaid and the Commerce Clause. Um, taxing individuals, no problem. You, government can't force you to buy insurance, but it can tax you if you don't. So individuals are under, you know, sufficient, can be subjected to substantial regulation in the ways that states are not. So I find it an interesting case of federalism, which I think from the court's perspective was what this case was about. What do you think the practical um, implications are? John, perhaps you could talk a little bit. Do you think many states will opt out? Um, how will that work itself out from the Medicaid standpoint? Well, states are already twisting themselves into pretzels, trying to figure out, shall we or shall we not set up our own exchanges? And some are moving ahead. Some are saying, heck no. Others are still trying to work their way through it. And so now we add another monumental option on the menu of things that states have to decide. 
Many states will say, yes, we want it. I think some states, at least through November, will absolutely say, heck no, we don't want to be a part of this at all. And then some states are going to be very divided and tense. This is a strikingly good deal for states, the Medicaid expansion, 100 percent federal assumption of costs for the first three years and only trending down to 90 percent and staying there after 2017. So states will have a lot of pressure, a lot of conflicting pressures, but I don't think we will really again be able to understand where states will come out until we get past November 6th. Look, there's been a lot of talk about the, um, the penalty, or as we now know it, the tax, and whether it will be, um, whether it'll have enough teeth to actually be effective in uh, persuading people to buy. John, Reggie, would you be able to talk a little bit about the impact? Well, uh, countries that have universal coverage, like the, um, the Act, which is... Uh, Switzerland, Netherlands, Germany, with a private health insurance system, they have, <laughs> they have some penalties. So in Switzerland, which has about 99% compliance, uh, you have to demonstrate you've purchased it on your income tax. If you haven't demonstrated it, the government buys you an insurance policy and bills you. They're Swiss. They're not that nice, but they're very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't pay the bill, they take your house away. They have lawsuits <laughs> to confiscate private property. So, you know, we don't have a lot of data on what penalties do and do not work, but our penalty, which goes up to 2.5% of income, which is substantial. That's not a bad penalty. But we really don't have enough data to say conclusively what it should be. But penalties like the Swiss dwarf in severity what we have here. I, I just add to that. So we do have the experience, though, here in Massachusetts, where we've had a penalty now since 2007. And there were many claims when we were doing Massachusetts implementation that the penalties were not large enough and nobody would pay attention, people would pay the penalty. And some people do, and that's what you're allowed to do. But the truth is we have gotten to over 98% coverage of the population. There's no penalty for children not to get coverage, and we're at 99.8% of children. There are no penalties for low-income folks, but we have almost eliminated the issue of eligible and unenrolled in Medicaid in Massachusetts. So. Again, Massachusetts doesn't demonstrate the rest of the country. There are many cultures in this country. But in terms of just can it feasibly work and is there a model where it has, I think we've got a good demonstration here in Massachusetts that it can. Although arguably the, it doesn't address the cost issue um, and the issue of rising costs that certainly in Massachusetts there's been um, an expansion of coverage, near universal coverage, but <coughs> costs are still expanding. How would that be different, if at all, on a national level? And how, how does the government even begin to get around that? So um, I hate to disagree with John. I'm so happy for John. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm an academic, so what can I say? Massachusetts is the third wealthiest state in the United States. So we have. We're very fortunate. Uh, we have median family income of 66,000 versus 50,000 nationally. So, you know, what happens in Massachusetts, I wish we could take it as an example, but it's, I don't think, a great example for poorer states. So, on the cost issue, that's a very serious issue in Massachusetts with its universal coverage, which I've always supported, has experienced the same kind of cost increases as other states, and we have among the world's highest costs. So this bill will add about a trillion dollars into our health care costs. Uh, internationally, we're by far the highest uh, health care costs as a percentage of GDP. We're roughly 
at 18%. We're competing with the Europeans who are at 11%. Forget about the Europeans. The Indians spend $50 per person per year on health care. And now we're going to add a trillion dollars over the 10-year scoring period to these costs. Healthcare mm -hmm. is not a terrifically productive industry. So um, healthcare delivery, in fact, has negative labor productivity. And what that means in English is you throw more money into this as part of the whole GDP. Relatively, we become a less productive uh, country and we compete globally. So we've got to get serious about cost control. Universal coverage, of course we need that, but the cost control issue is a real issue. Yeah. If, if I could just add, uh, it's an extremely important point. Uh, of course, we spent the last 50 or 60 years trying to control costs mm -hmm. without any success whatsoever, because one way to control costs is to exclude people from the system. And in Massachusetts, I think we, we decided, and the ACA is another example, that no one will take cost control seriously until everyone is in the system and you're absolutely positively forced to deal with it. Now, it's still not easy, <laughs> as we can see with the debate in the legislature, but I suspect that um, the notion of cost control before universality will never work and that we will only be able to face it now that we have everybody in the system. Almost everybody. I think we actually we have some recent good news from Massachusetts. As recently as 2009, the Commonwealth Fund had Massachusetts number one in per capita health insurance costs. And over the past couple of years, we've actually gone down mm -hmm. to number nine. So uh, we are, in fact, an example of moving ahead of the rest of the country. And I think there's something helpful about this process. And what's helpful about this process is that when you get coverage out of the way, you are, in fact, more able to focus more intensively on costs. And we can see that experience very much now in Massachusetts. Coverage is done. I, I call coverage health reform 1.0. I call system delivery reform and cost health reform 2.0. Public health wellness prevention 3.0. <laughs> health in all policies, health reform 4.0. That's where we want to get to. That's the goal. But I think we can see an evolution, and Massachusetts is a good example, and other countries as well. Other countries don't argue about universalism. They're there, and they are focused much more and much more successfully than we are in terms of dealing with costs and quality. Bob, um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about the exchanges and the way and the relationship between the exchanges and um, businesses. This may be more for Reggie, I'm not sure, but um, is there a concern that small businesses will essentially dump people onto the exchanges, what will be the effect on the relationship between um, employees and, and small businesses? How are they going to respond? Well, let, let me split this with Reggie uh, and uh, others. Um, it is a great discussion that if you have a lot of incentives, employers really don't want to cover their employees. It'd be a lot easier to have them get it somewhere else. Because my field is politics and I actually interviewed employers, a lot of them don't trust the government. So for me to take my employees and send them down and say, assumes that the Congress is going to keep putting up this contribution year after year. And in uh, experiences I've had is there's great suspicion. So the U.S. Chamber of Commerce cannot be against this bill 100% as they are and then tomorrow say what you need to do is send your employees down uh, for that. <laughs> Over the long term, uh, employers uh, do calculations, which Reggie's much better than I do, and at the end of the day, it's unbelievably favorable for you. I think there would be a, a change. Uh, since uh, we, we are tethered to Massachusetts, we have to say it wasn't true in Massachusetts. Uh, I see John looking at me and say, uh, telling him that whatever you think the model says, it didn't work here. But Reggie has done a lot of work on the alternatives that could come. Well, I think, Bob, your point's terrific, that unless the employers are assured that these subsidies, which are substantial, that they're stable, they're not going to move. The last thing they want to do is disrupt their labor right. force. But there's a countervailing trend, and that is uh, I've met many CEOs my long life. I've never had a CEO say to me, 
You know, Reggie, what I love about my job is buying health care. <laughs> 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 Not one. So uh, there is a movement independent of this bill for CEOs to go into what's called defined contribution, which means they would cash out their employees of whatever employer-sponsored insurance they're now getting. They would go to exchanges, whether public. There are also a number of private exchanges starting run by insurance companies, benefit consultants, lots of people and say, go shop for yourselves. So there is a movement toward exchanges in the employer community, which will certainly change the dynamics of buying health insurance, for example. An exchange will offer a big number of insurance policies. Overwhelmingly, employers offer a choice of one. If you're lucky, you get a choice of two. So just the availability of the number of policies will change uh, the nature of healthcare purchases. And who do you think is going to ultimately, within the private sector, be the sort of winners and losers out of this, uh, the way the law is now shaped? I think the law is great for virtually every participant in healthcare, which is a massive sector and very important sector in our economy. The health insurers, if the subsidies hold up, will get 30 million more customers, albeit they're going to have this uh, regulation and oversight of their general and administrative expenses and profits. Net net, I think it's very positive for them. For providers, it's fantastic um, to uh, be uh, to have the the burden of this bad debt diminish tremendously important. For the medical technology industry, it's a huge win because they develop drugs, devices, diagnostics for sick people who now have guaranteed issue and they have no more lifetime exclusion. So although the market hasn't reflected it as yet, the hospital stocks have gone up 10%. Biopharma hasn't been affected, but I think it's a huge win for them. For the economy as a whole, question mark, you know, I think you're absolutely right. Without universal coverage, we cannot deal with cost control, but the way costs are now, it's, it's worrisome from a macroeconomic perspective. I'd like to turn the, uh, the, the discussion over to the floor and see if there are any questions. I'm sure there's many um, for, for our panel. Yes. Hi, I'm Nancy Kane from uh, Harvard School of Public Health. Nice to see you all. A very entertaining uh, discussion. Um, I have a question about um, the, the, sta the court's ruling that states do not, do not, cannot be coerced into expanding their uh, Medicaid uh, eligibility standards and, and coverage. And uh, that is that I am assuming that means that if you're a low income and you would have been in, in one of those expanded uh, Medicaid products, now you, you go on the exchange and get the 100% federal subsidy of your private insurance. And is there something I don't quite understand about that? And, and I guess um, if, in fact, you're low income and you go into the private health insurance and get, and get subsidized instead, isn't this kind of just expanding the, the provi private insurance and, and sort of privatizing Medicaid, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? So um, the way the law is written, the folks under 100% of the federal poverty line are eligible for Medicaid and are not eligible for coverage through the new state exchanges. So unless the federal statute were rewritten, those folks in a state that doesn't move to expand coverage are out in the cold. There's some funny business with the folks between 100 and 133 percent of poverty, but let's not go there for a while. The, the vast bulk of folks will not be eligible, which is one reason why I think, unless the statute's rewritten, there will be a huge amount of pressure 
on governors and legislatures from within those states to move and to move quickly to get into this in spite of the rhetoric, but they have to get past November 6th before they can really say that or else it looks disloyal and like you're endorsing the law, which they can't do. But so I would expect it is going to move and, and otherwise those folks are left out in the cold and that's a huge number of the neediest folks in our society. Indeed, did you have something to say? Well, I, yeah, I think it's another example of where um, there was more concern for the states than there were for individuals because they just they, they let the poor and the disadvantaged uh, out in the cold. Now, of course, states, it, there's the expansion stands. The question is really whether, was only whether the Secretary of Health and Human Services could impose the most radical penalty on people who, on the states who chose not to adopt the expanded standards. And the Secretary cannot terminate all the state's Medicaid funding if they decide not to accept the expanded eligibility. And so you're, you're probably right. In the long run, I would think people would want to take the deal. But in the short run, right. it's politically expedient not to. But it does harm. One of the arguments of the, of the opponents to the ACA was that this was uh, the use of Medicaid expanded eligibility was an integral part of the overall act because people would be expected to be covered under Medicaid and up to 133 percent of the poverty line and then the others would be able to purchase between 100 percent of the poverty line and 400 with subsidies and then other so it they were right about that um, but pulling the penalty uh, I don't know that I don't know how it's going to affect them in the longer run. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Hi, Matt Gilman, Harvard Medical School. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Wendy Mariner to read John Roberts's mind, <laughs> 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 and then ask Bob Blendon what the political ramifications are, because some people would say that um, he saved his own institution, but maybe set up the Republicans for an advantage by narrowing the Commerce Clause and calling what this is, calling the penalty a tax. So um, I know you can't actually read his mind, but I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about where you think the court is going and then, Bob, talk about where you think the ramifications politically of, of, uh, of how the um, opinion was stated. Well, in many respects, the dissent by Kennedy, Scalia, Alito, and Thomas uh, reads like a majority opinion that lost its fifth vote <laughs> at the last minute. It's a job. <laughs> um, and Paul Campos argues this in Salon, I guess, uh, and, and, with, and persuasively. For First of all, if one were to uphold the mandate as a tax, there is no need to address another constitutional question. It's gratuitous to make the argument about the Commerce Clause. They clearly wanted to make it, and perhaps that was the original decision. Who knows? Uh, I have refused to speculate about this from day one because I thought there was a, a, a textual hook for opponents to the ACA with respect to the mandate being called a penalty. Um, and they took it <laughs> on the Commerce Clause. The tax question, it's clear that uh, Robert said, well, we should find, if at all possible, a way to find something constitutional, if possible, because we have a co-equal branch of government uh, that said that. But it's clear that he does this grudgingly, and who knows why. Maybe he did not want to be the Chief Justice who struck down the most important piece of social legislation since 1965, perhaps, uh, certainly in an election year. I have, I have no idea. And I, and I refuse to speculate on these things, but it, it, it reads oddly. What would be the practical consequences? I mean, just to follow on from the questioner here, um, the kind of cases that could potentially be affected by this um, reading of the Commerce Clause going forward, um, how widespread uh, might the impact be? Well, there have been many arguments that this that a limitation on the Commerce Clause could bring down a great deal of, of federal legislation. It's not clear to me that it will uh, uh, affect a dramatic number. We will still be able to have an FDA and an EPA and an OSHA and all of those because they are affecting 
things that are already engaged in commerce. The premise of the limit was that Congress could not force people into commerce who were not actually participating, but could only regulate commerce that actually existed. You see, it's simple. I brought Constitution is supposed to be very simple. Just apply the law. The decision um, <laughs> is. <laughs> But I do think they've drawn a pretty hard line about engagement and did not buy the argument pressed by some of us and restated very nicely in Justice Ginsburg's um, dissent on the Commerce Clause that the connection between health care and health insurance is, is, that health insurance is in effect really simply a payment mechanism and not entering the health care system, uh, self-insuring if you will is simply another way. Economists understood it, but Robert said, we don't care what economists say. We're talking about the law. Bob, did you want to address the political side? It, yes. So uh, I want to make the odd situation that this actually helps uh, the concern about Governor Romney, the particular decision. Let me give you an example. If the mandate was uh, ruled down, it would have been in my terms on a civil liberties issue. They would have argued that it was an infringement. So the uh, if in his situation, he can defend the argument that each state should do its own thing, but you cannot defend an argument that each state should infringe upon your civil liberty. So he would have had not, it's not the legal side, a difficult political side, describing where I can make you buy broccoli in Massachusetts, but I can't make you buy it nationally. This, uh, he now have, does not have to address that. Uh, secondly, he's running against taxes. And the court allowed him to have $40 million of ads which just say it's a big tax increase. And what would be interesting is you watch the ads, how many of them get how small the tax is, as you just heard it here, from what you'll see in an ad on CNN. <laughs> so uh, it'll look like, oh my God, the, uh, the amount I am, uh, I am paying. In general, the president's the big winner out, out of yesterday. But it turns out because Governor Romney has us as a history in Massachusetts, <laughs> this particular decision makes it easier for him to run against the president. But it doesn't make it easier for the Republicans because it really gave the president a, a boost. American undecided voters like people who win. So the, the, what the newspaper basically says to an undecided voter is, he won. I don't understand what he's talking about, but uh, he won. And that will be very helpful. But it allows the governor not to have to defend what I think would have been a very difficult issue about why I force you to buy something in a state. But it's okay here, but not nationally. So he doesn't have to address that. And when the president asked him that question, you heard it here first, he's going there. He's never going to answer uh, how that bill would have worked nationally. He's just going to talk about the economy and that tax. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, Must I'm be somebody from Switzerland. I'm Caitlin <laughs> Hubbard, and I'm a member of the forum staff here at the Harvard School of Public Health. And one of the features of the forum is that we take questions from our online audience. So I have a question here today from Angela Crane, who is a physician in New Hampshire. And she's asking, who are the 32 additional Americans who are going to receive health coverage under the Affordable Care Act? Um, are they Americans who use the emergency department for primary care services? Or are they Americans who present with end-stage diseases because they've had financial considerations present them from seeking care earlier? Um, I would also add, perhaps, are these people who've been unable to receive health care coverage previously because of um, uh, pre-existing conditions? Who are these new people who are being covered? Yes. <laughs> Could cover John any of them. Yes. <laughs> so 32 million Americans, yeah. that's according to the Congressional Budget Office estimate. And so half of those people, about 16 to 17 million, are very low income. They have family incomes below 133% of the federal poverty line, meaning if they're an individual, they have annual income of under $15,000. Those folks are targeted to be covered through the Medicaid expansion. And then about another 16 million have incomes between 133% and 400% or four times the federal poverty level. And those folks are eligible for sliding scale subsidies. Many of these folks are sick, chronically ill. Many of them are young and healthy. They really do reflect the broad diversity of the United States. They just live significantly uh, much more in southern states. Some of it, one of the ironies of this is 
that uh, the principal beneficiaries on a state-by-state -state basis are the populations in Texas, Louisiana, Florida, who are the most opposed to the law. Um, and, uh, but, it, but other than that, it's, it's a fairly diverse, fairly diverse group of, of American society who will be among those 32 million. In, in addition to the poor, the chronically ill, who have incredible health care expenses, uh, the, the limit in the high-risk pools in the states, in one state, is $26,000 a year. So the chronically ill follow Pareto's law, which is this obnoxious law you all had in your economics 101, <laughs> which is the 2080 rule. So out of the CBO 32 million, there is 6.4. If we take 20% as being chronically ill who are uninsured, and right now the high-risk pools cover about 300,000. So the chronically ill are in addition, of course, to low-income people, but people who are very sick, who have massive health care costs, they're going to be covered. Yes. Uh, Ed Nardell, Ed Nardell, a physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, we're sort of getting into that, but uh, on the quality of insurance, um, I understand that many people are faced with large deductibles or large co-pays, uh, even though they are, quotes, covered. Can you address that? So the law establishes limits in terms of how much people can face in terms of deductibles. Those limits are around the same limit for health savings accounts now, meaning that your deductibles as an individual or a family can't be higher than those limits, about 6000 for an individual and about 15000 for family coverage. Those limits are shocking to most people because most people don't have deductibles that high, particularly in a place like Massachusetts. Around the country, there are many, many people who have insurance coverage right now with levels of cost sharing, deductibles, and coinsurance that is just shocking. People literally have policies where you pay premiums every month and you're not eligible for any benefits until you pay at least, for example, twenty to thirty thousand dollars out of pocket. That kind of policy will not be allowed under the Affordable Care Act. I think the limits are actually still too high in terms of what people can be exposed to. Um, happily for folks 400% of poverty or below, there are even stronger protections in terms of how much you might be exposed to. So there's progress, I'd say from my perspective, not enough progress, but definite progress in terms of getting at the, the major issue after uninsurance, which is underinsurance, of people who have nominal insurance and then they can't really take advantage of it. Um, Dr. Nardell, I uh, think that a high deductible is uh, anathema for low-income people, but for middle-income and above people, it is a very good mechanism for cost control. And um, it would be wonderful if we could make it all free. It would be ideal. But in my view, health care costs are a very serious problem for the economy, and high deductibles may not have an appeal. But uh, studies of their effects have shown they're very good in controlling costs. And for middle income and above people, they don't deter from health care status. I think but it depends can't. how high you go. I think it depends on the level that we're talking about here. So Switzerland has a mandatory deductible of 2000 um, It's in Swiss francs, but equivalent to 2000 it has the highest quality of care among the European countries in many measures. So, um, and it is, uh, I would rather that the deductible be tied to income, mm -hmm. clearly. What is onerous for somebody who earns 20,000 is not onerous for somebody who earns 150,000. 
But it's an important cost control tool, not the only one we have, and I hope not the one that's used the most, but we shouldn't just dismiss it out of hand. And around that, there does seem to be quite a bit of uh, perhaps misunderstanding about who will have to pay the, the, the penalty. I mean, can you just perhaps really clarify down um, people saying, well, we're being forced to do this and we're not going to, we can't possibly afford it. Um, do we have any percentages here of the number of people who, who that's going to affect? So the number of people, well, we, have, we have data from Massachusetts, so less than 1% of the public mm. pays the mandate penalty in Massachusetts. Actually, it's about 30,000 people who pay. And by the way, those people are not breaking any law. That is a choice they have. They can buy insurance or I can pay the penalty, and it's your choice, and either way you're compliant with the law. The sense is that, and the, pur the purpose of the penalty, and I guess it, you know, people say, is it a penalty or is it a tax? Uh, let's just be clear, it's a tax penalty. <laughs> <laughs> we have you this should have argued in the Supreme yes. Court. <laughs> <laughs> Much better frame, guys. We have, this, we have this phenomenon in American society where everything has to be either this or that, and in fact, it's both, <laughs> and it, it's either, and it's neither. It depends how you want to strike it. But well, that's what the court said. The court said, well, it's not a tax for purposes of the Anti-Injunction exactly. Act, so we could decide the case, but it is a tax for purposes of the constitutional definition, and they do try to distinguish penalties from taxes, and the case law in this is um, not always ideal, shall we say, but, there, but the, the winning argument um, at least in Robert's from Robert's perspective, was that there was no um, criminal punishment available. And therefore, uh, the only thing that need happen, should you choose not to buy uh, insurance or be covered in any other way, was that you would pay the tax. You, you, know, you couldn't get thrown in prison, you, know, you wouldn't have additional penalties piled on, and therefore you could be compliant without being punished or non-compliant. You would, you would always be compliant, either buying the insurance or paying the penalty. Okay. Further questions? Uh, thank you. Um, the, the reason I think has been addressed, but the, my concern around um, the deductibles has to do with, I, I run a tuberculosis clinic, and, uh, and I think it applies to other preventive services, things that are not really felt by the patient as a crying need, but something that either has a public good or preventive good, and I think that's where the, the deductibles and the co-pays uh, really impact. If I can respond, um, there, certainly at, at lower income levels, as Regina pointed out, the, there is some data that it does discourage people from getting care. So the question is, is it really lowering costs because people don't get care that they shouldn't, or is it simply shifting costs to people who have to pay out of pocket, and it's lowering costs, for example, from the employer's perspective. This is, you know, if you, whose costs whose costs are being saved. Eventually, um, insurers are going to be faced with the need to create substantial pressure on providers to pay something less, because in fairness to the insurance companies. Um, we, including academic institutions, are pumping out all of this new technology and new treatments, and we're telling everybody how wonderful it is, and the Americans are saying we want the best and we want the most, and then we're telling the insurers and the patients, just say no, because <laughs> it's too expensive. Well, fire hydrant stuff is coming out, and we're expecting them to solve our problem. I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> so just as a uh, factual matter, the high deductibles typically have a savings account, not, not to get too wonky on this, yeah. that goes with it. And that savings account covers preventive care. It's a very important part of the high deductibles. I think your point is absolutely right. Additional questions? Another one from online? We do have another question from an online viewer, Marsha Taylor, who is at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. And she's asking if the panel would please discuss the issue of physician shortages when so many more people are now insured. Would like to take that? So there are issues around the U.S. healthcare workforce and whether it's adequate. And those predate the ACA. 
Uh, there are concerns that the ACA will make it worse when 30 million more Americans are eligible for health insurance coverage. And so there is a big part of the law, Title V of the law, which is specifically focused on healthcare workforce. Uh, and one of the most exciting things in that title is the creation of a National Workforce Commission, uh, the first ever uh, appointed by the Comptroller General, a uh, national body to do research, analysis, planning, recommendations to the administration, Congress, states, the American public on how to address our workforce challenges going forward. There's a lot in the law that actually directly helps, but that's one of the things that people were the most excited about. That body got appointed by the Controller General in the fall of 2010, ready to sit down and get going to work. Uh, it's now nearly two years later. They've yet to have their first meeting because the Republican-controlled House of Representatives has been unwilling to release the couple of million dollars necessary to enable it to sit down and start working. So there are lots of parts of the law. There is a huge increase in funding for community health centers, huge funding for something called the National Health Service Corps, which subsidizes young physicians who go out to rural underserved areas and provide medical services. Pre-ACA, there were about 3,000 enrollees, people participating in the uh, National Health Service Corps. Today, there are more than 10,000 because of the ACA. So there are things in there that move it forward and that address it. I don't think there's enough in there that will really conclusively solve our workforce challenges, but it was meant to create a structure to be able to move forward and address that better. Not physicians, yes, also nurses, also all manner of health professionals, because it's not just about physicians, it's about a lot more than that as well. But within Massachusetts, I mean, that there has been a primary care, an increase in primary care shortage, shortages, which many attribute to the, to the, to the act here. Yeah, you know, if you, if you listen to this issue and you followed it, you would believe that the only state in the nation that has any <coughs> problems with healthcare <laughs> workforce shortages <laughs> is Massachusetts. The Wall Street Journal editorial page focuses on this almost on a weekly basis. <laughs> the truth is, Massachusetts has the highest number of physicians per capita. We have the highest number of primary care physicians per capita in the country. We have the highest number of nurses, nurse practitioners, psychologists, dentists, podiatrists, you name a health professional. We're either number one, number two, or number three. We have had areas where we've had spot shortages, geographically dispersed, that precede health reform, and there's probably been some increase in pressure because of health reform. Uh, and uh, when I talk to people in the federal government about workforce challenges in Massachusetts, the first response I usually get is a gigantic laughter <laughs> because <laughs> the challenges that we face in Massachusetts are so insignificant mm -hmm. compared with the workforce challenges in most of the rest of the country. Yes. I'm Greg Wagner. Uh, you talked about the decision in the ACA in terms of universal coverage. You talked about the 32 million uh, people uh, projected to have coverage that weren't. Who won't be covered if this is fully implemented? So according to the C to Congressional Budget Office, and there's varied estimates, but the CBO suggests after implementation by 2019 or so, full implementation, We'll still have about 24 million uninsured. Their estimate is about a third of those are going to be undocumented immigrants. About a quarter of those are going to be people who are eligible for Medicaid and don't come forward and enroll in coverage. And that's kind of a little bit less of a problem because those folks will be entitled to care in their state. And when they show up at a health center or a hospital, they can get enrolled on the spot. Uh, about a, another quarter will be folks who still, who still don't have affordable coverage available to them because of their particular employment situation. And then the rest are going to be people who will voluntarily pay the penalty rather than get coverage. Wendy, did you have something? Well, I would just, I would just uh, add that uh, there, there will be a, possibly a chunk of those who would be eligible for Medicaid coverage yes. under the expanded definition who won't get it in states that choose not not right. to expand their eligibility. That's a new category since yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, Josh Solomon from the uh, Harvard School of Public Health. 
Uh, just thinking about uh, looking ahead to the, the timetable for implementation, uh, there are dates that, that we all have in our head, like 2014 when the mandate goes into effect. But is there a point as implementation uh, proceeds when uh, essentially this, uh, the, the law will become unappealable, either legally or for reasons uh, that the implementation has, has gone so far? Or can we expect to actually uh, this to be an issue for, for several election cycles to come? Um, well, I could say it's certainly unappealable now with respect to whether it's, but whether it's an issue or whether it will be amended or whether it will be an election, that's, that's absolutely so, possible. Uh, uh, for anybody who's watching from another country, we have a parliamentary s system, one party wins and they generally win. Uh, there's a possibility here uh, that both sides can be claiming victory uh, on November 6th. Uh, one party has the House and the Senate, uh, one party has. Uh, the presidency, and it's the president, and he says, now I'm going to implement my bill. And the others look at each other and said, but we just won to repeal this bill. <laughs> uh, so uh, they can't repeal it. What they can do is saw financial pieces. And so uh, if it goes one way or the other, that's why uh, a sweep one way or the other will settle this issue. We can go on whatever health care is going. But a split decision by the electorate is going to mean that they're going to saw off John's commission. Uh, he'll be talking about this manpower commission, and someone from Utah is going to be just sawing away at it uh, uh, for it. So we have to resolve this because it's, there's no, unlike Massachusetts, there's no bipartisan gene here at all. Uh, one side wants it going the other. So until we resolve that mix, uh, we're going to have this. But whether or not it goes forward or, or not, the court plus the election will settle it. The 20-some governors, many of them are going to watch this election. Uh, if the president wins and the balance goes, they're just going to be implementing everything we've been talking about uh, for it. Uh, but if the House and Senate are completely where they were, they're going to wait and see and drag this thing out. Uh, but these are the other areas. It, it's helpful for people to remember that some states did not come into Medicaid for almost 12 years, Arizona and, and Alaska. Uh, for that, and uh, the meeting would have been how can we go on and everything else. And the answer is, after a while, people watch New York take all the money, and they finally <laughs> said, you know, maybe Arizona should get a share of this, where John was. So these things may be pushed out. If the one party is the dominant, ultimately it's going to move forward, but it may take seven years and not four. Uh, these arbitrary limits in politics are not good to think of. The question is whether or not the structure's there, the direction's there, and that'll be determined by the election. We have time for just one more question. Anyone has one? I have something. Yes, well, <laughs> please. Uh, Sarah Singer from Harvard School of Public Health. I wanted to ask another question about the Medicaid expansion. I'm thinking, I'm curious about the potential repercussions of having states doing different things with respect to this law, with the exception of Hawaii and Alaska that are sort of separated, we've got really porous borders. And so what would be the repercussions for, for business, for the, uh, for, uh, you know, the uninsured, uh, if the states are doing different things? Well, welcome to Medicaid. <laughs> <laughs> the, saying, the saying about Medicaid is that if you've seen one state Medicaid program, you've seen one state Medicaid program because <laughs> they vary so much. And the vision, the vision of Title II of the ACA was to begin to move Medicaid toward a more genuinely national program with common eligibility standards regardless of where you live, common application enrollment procedures, all of those things, and there's been some, and it doesn't get written about, and the Obama administration doesn't even want to talk about it because they don't like to brag about it, but there's fantastic work going on inside the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services getting ready for, uh, for the Medicaid expansion. A former Massachusetts native, a really smart lady named Cindy Mann, runs Medicaid for CMS, and she's been doing Medicaid for about 30 years. And they are doing fantastic stuff, and so it is, it's a tragedy that the real concrete difference between two days ago and today is that that vision of Medicaid as being finally something of a national program has uh, been tattered, uh, at least to some extent. We're not quite sure how much yet. 
30. Did you go into 30? Yeah, I think um, we have not talked about a very, despite your wonderful moderating, very important aspect of the law, which is that it's going to reorganize health care delivery. So why are our costs so high? Duh. Uh, we have very inefficient health care delivery system because it's fragmented, not sufficiently integrated, there's insufficient IT, and the payment mechanisms that we have reinforce that fragmentation because they pay different providers fee-for-service. So under this legislation, there will be payment for integrated care, either for bundles of care for people who have chronic diseases or disabilities, or for totally integrated care, a great vision whose feasibility I personally doubt, but I hope I'm wrong, called the accountable care. Primary care has a role, and I think those are tremendously important innovations in payments that also enable measurements of quality. Once care is bundled, you can hold that bundler responsible for the quality of care. That will have tremendous effects on the cost and quality of U.S. health care. Yeah, I'll give you uh, the all but last word if you'd like to just, you, do you have a, something that you no, I was just thinking that um, there's some there's some irony in the fact that what the court decided to uphold was again the taxing power, uh, which is largely unlimited, and yet that is precisely the power that the Congress is least willing to use, uh, and in the and I think we will see that in the in the negotiations, and I worry particularly about discussions with the deficit. Uh, and the costs of implementing this act, that what they will chop off will be a great deal of these innovative programs, and especially public health, which is always last at the table. Well, with that, we will uh, wrap up this uh, fascinating discussion, which I'm sure everybody's going to be continuing for the next weeks and <laughs> months and years <laughs> and decades. And <laughs> so thank you very much to thank our you. panel. Thank you. Appreciate thank your you time. Too, you. And thank you all for joining us and online, to our viewers online. Thank you very much.